I grew up in show business from really the age of seven. Uh, I went to a, a convent. We were doing ballet dancing then. I was doing my exams, passing through with honours. Then they stopped giving ballet classes. So I had been recommended a, a stage school to go to. So I went to uh, a stage school. And as I got older, I became more interested in the drama, the musical side. Carried, still love dancing. And then started doing TV adverts and uh, mainly theatre. At 12, I was at the London Palladium, just around the corner from here. <laughs> Uh, for six months. Then I went into The Sound of Music, played Louisa at the Shaftesbury Theatre here, and it really just went on from there. And then I started doing more television. And then uh, my agent phoned me up one day and said, oh, they're looking for a girl to go to Hollywood to do this TV series uh, called The, the Bugaloos. And I thought, oh, yeah, we've heard that all before. It's just publicity, publicity stunt. And I phoned up a friend of mine. I said, are you going? And she said, yeah, come on. Well, we'll just go along for a laugh. And I can remember we had to go to EMI Studios in London. I don't know if you remember this, John. And we sort of went in for groups at about 12 at a time. And I went in with a couple of... I went in with... Uh, there was Lulu. Do you remember Lulu? Mm -hmm. I worked with her later on in the theatre in Peter Pan. And there were one or two others. And I thought, well, they're famous. They're not... You know, that's it, isn't it, really? And then each one, we sat round in a circle. There were about 12 of us in a room at a time. Each one had to sing a song. No backing, no music, nothing. And I sung, I sung yesterday. And uh, then we all went out. And then after a couple of minutes, somebody came out of the room and said, OK, so-and-so can stay. Caroline, you can stay. So the rest of you can go home. Well, I've got to stay. I'm staying. Oh, my goodness me. Oh, well, you know, fair enough. It's just publicity. And it really went on from then. And it went on for, for about a week. And then we had to do dancing. Then we had to do uh, videos, taping and dancing, a bit of everything, until it was gradually down to just about... There were two of us, myself and a girl called Janie. And we were actually doing a fashion show at the Grosvenor Hotel together. I can remember that. And then there was down to you... Tell me to shut up if I'm talking too much. Uh, then it was down to, you, down to you and about five other boys, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah. And um, I have to tell a, tell a little story. We'd been out to dinner at one of the hotels. We sit at Marty Croft. And we came out, all sort of going to go home. And Marty said to me, Caroline... You get in the taxi with me. We're going both back to the hotel. And I thought, oh, my goodness me, what does this mean? Anyway, I got into the taxi with Marty. And he said to me, you've got the job. And I said, come on, don't mess around. Please don't mess around. I've gone through all this. You know, I don't, don't, don't be cruel or anything. You've got the job. I said, please don't. By this time, I've thought of things. Oh, I'm getting red in the face. Oh, my goodness me, getting more and more excited. And he said, no, you've got the job. However... We don't want you to tell anybody or say anything because we haven't decided yet with the boys. So for two days, Janie and myself, Janie didn't know that she hadn't got the job. I knew that I had the job, but I couldn't say anything for two days. But well, you until didn't they know. Had, but well, I didn't know. Tell <laughs> me, carry but on. I had the job also. Oh, you knew? I, I, well, they were staying at the Dorchester Hotel. I didn't hotel, know this. This is And new. on the, the very first night, I went up on a Sunday, I believe, for the first audition, and I was asked to stay over for the Monday, which meant they put me up in the Dorchester. But we're, we're having dinner in the evening. Both the Crofts were there. And then Lionel Bart was there, you know, the, the composer of Oliver. Ah, that's right. And it was such a fantastic experience. And I was told then over dinner that I had the job. But to keep it storm, you know, you must have told you. Know, I never knew that. So I'm, I'm like, oh, well, excited. Now I just want to tell the world, you know, they've got yeah, this job. And I, I think at the end of the day, you've got to think, um, I, I wasn't, I didn't come from a theatrical background, although I was on stage at five. Uh, I played Joseph in our nativity play, so I got a taste of it at a young age, which was brilliant, it was great. I moved on, and then I, I was more a musician than an actor, and I, my course was more or less in music, so I started professionally as a drummer-singer, and, and then I saw this chance come up. It was in the Daily Newspaper, and there was a paper at the time called The Sketch. Daily Sketch. Very similar to, <laughs> yeah. um, I suppose, The Sun and the Mirror. Perhaps a forerunner to both, I think. Yes. And it just said that these Hollywood producers were coming to England to look for four typically young British kids who can act and sing. Well, I could do neither, so I thought I'm going to apply anyway. Okay. So that's what I did. And I literally, 
um, sent off a letter with some um, stills. And I got a telegram, actually, and it was on my 21st birthday. The telegram came through at my door. So it was such a great birthday present. Oh, it was fantastic. the best thing in the world. And it just said, please uh, be in touch. You've got to contact this number, ask the so-and-so. So that's what I did. And that was it. So that's how I got involved with the Bugaloos. Sid and Marty Croft, uh, the, only, the only time I'd heard of Sid and Marty Croft was, of course, from Puff and Stuff. They were the producers of it, and you saw the credit, Sid and Marty Croft, etc. But no, in England, they weren't known. Obviously, in America, yes, but I hadn't been to America at that point, so I didn't know. So I didn't know who they were until I read about it, and my agent phoned me up and said, you know, go along for the audition. And then, of course, you it, in the newspaper, it gave you the information of what they'd done, other programmes that they'd done, etc., etc. But up until that time, no, I hadn't... If I'd seen their name, it wouldn't have... Sid and Marty Croft didn't mean anything to me. They but were just after Hollywood that, producers that yes, were coming to England looking exactly. for something specific. Yeah. And I think it was on the back of Puff and Stuff because of Jack Wilde, the English yes. element, the Cockney kid, the music. So therefore they were looking for that Cockney aspect as well. Because I think they wanted us to be more like Cockneys, didn't they? Yeah. Of course, Caroline's very, you know. I, I'm not a Cockney at all, am I, darling? No, I mean, I don't so stand a chance, really. We had to learn that. <laughs> and it's like the, the, the lingo, the, the Cockney slang, a lot of it was scripted. Yeah. But it was the American version of Cockney slang. So we then had to understand what that was all about and then get into the actual Cockney itself, what's that mm. all about, and learn. Because Cockney slang isn't how it's written. It, they only use certain parts of the Cockney slang. Apples and stairs will be referred to just, oh, I'm going up the apples. But when it's scripted, it's apple and pear, so it doesn't sound right. So we would have this talk with our um, script, what was it, script um, yeah. supervisor. Say, so, look, you know, can we just move this on, move on, on? And that's an American expression. I don't think we should perhaps do that. But this is what they would say in, 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 in London. And oh, also, I remember that we couldn't, uh, we couldn't talk quickly. Because if we spoke in a, in a, in English the way we're talking like today, diction, dear, the, diction, diction, people wouldn't understand what we were saying. We were talking too quickly. So the script you had to sort of keep pretty well to the. Once we'd sort of decided, okay, for the Cockney slang, put this in here, whatever. You had to keep it pretty, pretty, pretty clear, uh, so that the American American youngsters could understand. Just it. an example, an American um, interpretation of Cockney slang is. Elliot Ness, what a mess. And no one's ever even heard of that. But that's that's just the the some sort of barrier you come up against. That's not you just iron out on screen, just post filming. But it's interesting, you know, it really is interesting that, you know, we need to adjust to that. Mm. I think we need to incorporate some of that for the understanding and to come across to that audience. So we, we did quite a lot of compromising. Yes. Of course, with Caroline, with her well-spoken English, it, it uh, took a while to, for her to say, "How's your father, mate?" Didn't you? <laughs> well, I actually didn't have to speak with a Cockney. No, that's accent, true. No, I? no, you're very, very yeah. um, normal, I suppose. Normal. Yeah. When I first went to America, landed in at LA airport, got off the plane, and came out outside with the luggage where we were having cars picking us up, and I saw a palm tree, and I ran up to this palm tree and put my arms around a palm tree. Because I, palm trees, to me, sort of meant everything to do with sun and, and it was everything. We don't have palm trees in London, basically. So it was just, you know, some. it was just another world. It was just another world. It was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. It was just a, like a, a dream come true to be given to be given this opportunity. But that palm tree, I can I can always remember, I can still see it now, coming out of the airport, seeing a palm tree, running up to the palm tree and putting my arm around it. Oh, it sounds a bit That palm tree's still there. It's and still oh, <laughs> Caroline Ellis hugged me, you know. Uh, so what do you remember when you first <laughs> came? I think it was the same. I think it was absolutely the same. It was like a long plane flight. I'd never experienced a long plane flight before. I think it was 12 hours. We came first class. Absolutely, yeah. We came on the plane first class. Champagne. We were well looked after, yeah. I have to say, that from yeah. start to finish. But, Fantastic. I mean, preceding that, I mean, they they kept us in London. We were, were at the Barbara Speaks Stage School. You were. And we were staying at a Barbara Speaks house, weren't we? So we had yes. sort of, like, private house to ourselves. So um, And then we went out shopping. We were actually buying Ravel shoes. It was wonderful, you know. <sighs> and this is all part of the makeup that when we arrived in L.A. airport, mm. that when we came off the plane, it was like, they've arrived. And I think there is a still of Sid and Marty with us 
in the um, just coming off the plane, isn't there? Yes. And we've got all these coats and jackets on and scarves. And, and it was really hot. It was. Fantastic. Came came out onto the onto the the you know down the stairs of the aeroplane, and it was just really really hot. Even for there, the temperature was really hot and really humid. And I just pouring. Oh my God! I come out in a pink dress. I might add a little pink number. And you just think, oh, God, it's going to start clinging to me and, oh, horrible. But it was. It was really hot. And that was something that you're not accustomed to, that you're just not used to. But it was the palm hot. tree syndrome. Just to see, that it wasn't one, it was many mm. of. And it was just the, the plane flight, the heat, yeah. the, the welcome that we received. We're in America, you know, a fantastic country you hear so much about. And we're here. This is mm. it. No, it was fantastic. And then there were there were things like, do you remember the house that we lived in, first of all? We were taken to this dirty great big mansion. And then we went, you know, the different places, all those things stick in my mind because they, they left such an impression. It was another planet. It was another world. It was just unbelievable. Because at the time I was 19... And... Uh, 21. 21. Are you telling the truth? Just. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just... It was just so... Alien, so completely different to the lives that we'd had back here in in England. I mean, I was in show business, and yes, I'd worked with famous people and worked in the theatre and worked in television, but Hollywood, I mean, that was just like the, the ultimate. It was just fantastic. It was very Absolutely whimsical. Fantastic. It, was, it was unbelievable because believable, you were there, you're actually walking on this territory and you're, you know where yes. you're going. But it was still a, um, we didn't know where we were going to stay. We just knew that we were going to be staying in a house. Mm. But to stay in this huge mansion, I mean, bearing in mind there was four of us plus our secretary, plus Jean, Jean yes. Anderson. She was our secretary and she did a wonderful job looking after us. Mm. And if it wasn't, I, don't, I think if it wasn't for her, it yes. wouldn't have been such an easy thing to settle into because she made everything so much more possible and easy. Yes. Everything was done she kept, for us. She kept everything, kept us all yeah. organised, basically. Yeah. So... We knew where we so were. So we just went we into this, you know, this big windy drive, and yeah. and there it was, this big white mansion on the hill. Yeah, and in we Hollywood. had. Me do you remember we had me a Mexican couple, a caretaker oh. and a cook, and that's when I was first introduced to Mexican food, and I've been eating Mexican food ever since, and I cook it myself now. She was terrific, and she used to do these Mexican foods and with the sour cream and the oh. Just delicious. She was a and wonderful since then, lady, actually. Since then, I've been hooked on Mexican food. But it was Fantastic. nice just for once, you know. We didn't have to do anything. And one thing I could say of the cross, we were well looked after. Yeah. We didn't have to shop. We didn't have to do anything. And it was great, but it was boring as well because we wanted to go out and do these things. We wanted to go to a supermarket. But this is all pre-shoot, so no, we weren't known. Apart from maybe a bit of media cover, I don't know what the yes, they'd been talking of the, in the in the teen magazines and things like that. They had started talking about these four youngsters being brought over from England, the new Sid and Marty Croft series, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But of course, nobody had seen the show; it hadn't been made, let alone tell. Mm. You know, we started making. And it ironically enough, out. we went out. I think it was just the boys. It was just John Wayne and I went out. I'm not sure. I think you may have been with us, mm -hmm. and we were just going down the the strip. The um, and we went into this music shop and there was Elton John. And he had just come over to America to start touring. So he's fairly unknown in America. So it was such a, it was a, so whimsical that you can go so far, be included in something so fantastic. And then there's someone else there that's equally as famous and doing the same sort of thing. So his musicians are there buying this out and the other, you know, for the, the tours. But I believe it was probably one of his first American tours. So he was starting out, we were starting out, and it was just, Apps. Mm. And of course, John, Big John, knew knew them. And Big John knew every, everybody. He introduced mm. us to lots and lots of people. When you look at the concept of the Bugaloos, you have two actors and two musicians. Now, Big John and Little John, myself, we were the musicians. And Caroline mm. and Wayne were the actors. So we were bouncing off each other all the time. And I taught you to play guitar, do you remember? Yes. And she said to me, well, will you teach me? I said, but you'll need to cut your nails first. And of course, she had these lovely nails. And I it took a, a big decision for you to do that. But, yeah. you know, so I was sort of helping in that respect. And then, of course, that would come, that'd be reciprocal with the acting. We'd go through lines and things like this. Mm. And when I first um, read the first script, I learned front to back. 
wrong because they don't film like that. And I wasn't aware of that, but I was told that that's, you know, that that scene may not be done until the end of the actual filming. Yeah, never in sequence. So, you know, I'm used to live performances, so it's start to finish, start to finish. And it was, it was such a, an experience. But it, it worked. We got on so well. Mm. And we, we, we really did like each other's company and we did go out quite a lot. And in fact, if someone wanted to go out, someone else said, yeah, I'll come with you. And we used to go out as a group. Our relationship with the rest of the cast and the people on the set, no, it was great. It was, we had Tony Charmley, who was the director, choreographer, and I always, I learned something from him because whenever things were taking too long, he'd go, time is money, time is money. So, and that always stayed with me because it's true, isn't it? Time is money. Yeah. You can mess around, you can have a good time, but at the end of the day, we're there to do a job. And this is costing a lot of money. And, and we were there uh, to have fun. To, so there's a bit we, of a we conflict. We, we couldn't, yeah, I mean, sometimes we'd, we'd be filming. And we got then, thrown off the set a few got times. Got thrown off the set. Say, yeah. We couldn't talk. We were just laughing so much, giggling. But that's the bonding we had. Not you know, very. We, it was, but it was good. But then everybody else in the, in the set was laughing as well. And Martha Ray was the world's worst. I mean, she was the world's worst. She was outrageous, wasn't she? Outrageous. She was really... Well, you can probably men remember stories better than I can. Well, I think yeah, she but she was a fantastic it. lady. We learned yeah, so much from nice. her. True, she almost adopted us. It, it was fantastic. We went to a lovely restaurant one night, didn't we? Mm. And it yeah. was like an introduction, like, you know, welcome and, and so on. It was really nice. But she was so professional, and mm. we all learned so much. And outrageous as well. Mm. And with Just Billy outrageous. Barty, it was the same. Yes. Because he was a drummer. At heart, and he, he probably had the smallest kit of drums in the world at that time. <laughs> I couldn't resist that because I'm a drummer, you see. So we, he would have this set of drums set up on the... We had two lots. We had 19 and 21, was it? The Oh, God, I can't remember. I think Lucille yeah. Ball was in between Lucy anyway. Lucille Ball was next door. That was quite interesting. Yeah. That's another story. So, yes. But, however, he would have his kit set up and he would just go and play these drums from time to time because you imagine there's quite a bit of time to kill during shooting. And of course, I would go with him, and then we would just talk drums and riffs and music in general. I'd ask about the American scene, he'd ask about the English scene, and I'd get on his drums and I'd say, Have you tried this riff and this riff and that? Mm. And we'd go missing, and we'd be there for hours, and then, you know, they'd come looking for us. And Billy and I would be at the back there playing these drums. And, you know, I, I really miss that guy, and sadly, he departed yeah. recently. And he, he, was, he was an absolute treasure, I think, to the Bugaloos. He was the backbone of the Bugaloos with support of Martha Ray, of course, you know. And, of course, we named that dog that sort of inherited ah. us called Sparky. When we lived up in near the park, we, we had a stray dog came along one day and he ended up being our dog. We called him Sparky after after Billy. Mm. But, uh, no, they were all wonderful. They were all different. All all of them on the set were it great. It was such a close set. Yeah. Uh, Good atmosphere. Close -knit set. Everyone knew each other anyway. I think they knew each other from previous productions with Sid, Sid Marty Crofts with Puff and Stuff and all the other things. Mm. And um, so they had that bonding anyway, so they all knew what they were supposed to be doing and when they were supposed to be doing it. So it, was, yes. it, was, it worked like clockwork. Of course, when we come in, all green as grass, you know, what's going on, what's happening here? And we met some good friends, and we yes. made some good friends on set. Yes. And it was, just, it was just fantastic. It was like one big family. And I think that was one thing that the Crofts did do for us, introduced us into this big family. And it was, mm. it was fantastic. What did you do when, when anything the Bugaloos I could finished? get, anything we could get, because it, we it was funny because we were on hold for so long, yeah, weren't we? We came, we came home. We came home for Christmas. We were doing a film with Columbia. And that's right. We were waiting to go back to start doing the, the film for no, Columbia. And then Columbia at, at that time and... went bankrupt. Yes. Yeah. Didn't they? This was back in 1970 or One, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Columbia went, went bankrupt. Uh, so the film was cancelled, and so we were waiting. They kept on saying, "Well, we're setting other things up. We're waiting, wait." But you know, you want to, you want to be busy. And I can't remember what month it was, but my agent phoned me up and said, "Well, there was a very successful TV series in children's TV series in England called The Free Wheelers, and they wanted me to do the 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 female." lead in it it was two fellas and a girl but it was an adventure series riding horses and tanks and all sorts of things and I thought well how long do I wait for what do I do I might not I don't know when I'm going back to the states I don't know what we're going back to now the film has been cancelled and I just thought no 
you know, I talked with my agent about it. So I did the free wheelers. It was it was uh, an, an opportunity I felt that I shouldn't say no to. So if I wanted, went in and did uh, did the free wheelers. I don't know. Wayne went off, I think, and did um, a children's a show. Children's well. show. Yeah. And John went back to America. John went and back stayed to there. America. And I just and looked for work, and... basically. Um, because I was more of a musician, I wasn't getting what I really wanted to do with the Bugaloos as a musician and, and singing. I, I wasn't the lead singer. I think you and John were the lead singers, really, in, yeah. in the Bugaloos. So I sort of went back to my basics and went out on the road, formed groups and went um, did auditions for musicals and things like this. And, you know, we did, did the odd summer seasons and things, but basically I wanted to get back on the road. I wanted to perform and to sing. So what I did, I sort of created my own band and we just went touring. We went, we went national in England, then we went to Scandinavia and sort of it was a living there, you see. Now I'm, I'm not really, I'm sort of more quiet now. I have a quieter life. Uh, I live on a little island now of Spain, uh, which is very pretty. I thought you owned that nice. island. No, not quite, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> and very happy. Very peaceful. My daughter, Sasha, who's here with me today to come and look and learn because she's actually studying uh, television, working for future work in television. Not as an actress, but on, on the other side, production side, sound, sound, sound and image side. So, uh, uh, so yes, now I'm sort of out of showbiz. Mind you, I suppose if somebody phoned up and offered me a, an offer I couldn't refuse, you never know. Oh, you darling, know. you're looking at it now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I stayed in, in show business. I did theatre and tellies oh, for, for many, many years because, what, I was 19, 20, and I carried on working. I was lucky. I was one of the lucky ones. I always got work uh, till, till I was 36 when I got pregnant, had Sasha, and then I thought, right, now I'll take a rest from show business. Um, and really then I came to Spain, ended up staying in Spain, and have been there ever since. Yes, I still miss it. Yes, I still crave for it. But as the time went on, it eased off because my daughter was the most important thing in my life to me. So she sort of took over, really, and that was it. I can't live without it. I have to do anything musical or acting. So I had to continue. And at that time, I was looking for an agency in London. And, of course, we were still in contact. And Caroline said, well, I'll introduce you to my agent, which is Ada Foster. Mm -hmm. Very well-respected agency, and they just don't take anybody on. But because of the recommendation, sure? I went to meet them. <laughs> they took me on. And I, and they took you on. <laughs> and I had to sing in front of them, you know, and I think, oh, should I sing a rock song? No, I'll sing a nice musical or something like that. So they took me on. And so I had a couple of agents. So I was working multi-agency. But again, it was more I wanted to sing. I wanted to perform yeah, live. And Ada Foster wasn't really probably the right but type of agent. It was a safety net for me because when I wasn't doing one, I was able to do the other. And at the end of the day, we've all got mortgages to pay and, and bugaloo money doesn't last forever. We were getting residuals. We were getting paid quite well mm. for actually doing nothing, but it was residual. But that will come to an end. So, you know, you need to pick up and just, just start again. Mm. And I think basically when we came back to England, it was starting again because no one knew us in England. We're unknowns virtually. Mm. So we had to really start again. So you have to look at your strengths and your it weaknesses. It's a shame, really, because I think an opportunity was missed. I think, okay, the film, the film fell through. But I think they should have, they were waiting. They kept on saying, well, they're waiting. They were going, waiting, trying to set things up. But the trouble is, if we had been there, I believe, sorry, Sid and Marty, but I think if you had taken us back, we were there. That is the PR. That is the promotion. And because you're there, then something would have, mm. you know, you know what I mean. But we had all come back to England, and little by little, we were drifting off, doing our own thing, and that That's was the right. problem. We'd done the work. The hard work was done. It was there, yeah. ready, and then, then it was had to be shown, and then obviously it just progresses from there. So when we came home in December 1970, yes. it was all fresh and new, and of course it gathered momentum year by year by year. Yeah. So after the fifth year, it was huge, it was massive, yeah. and we weren't a part of that. No, so it's we a shame. felt that you know we've got this ability. We could all sing, and we could actually sing live. You know, when, the time that we did spend together in the house that wasn't, you know, we were actually rehearsing yeah. so that we could sing these songs on the albums and so on. 
And we felt that that is something that really should have been exploited. We, we, we I, th- felt I that think was there was a, an opportunity the lost there, to be honest. Big opportunity. And it was a way yeah. of meeting the fans. The fans could see us. We could see the fans. And it was just... But over a period of time, like everything, if you don't keep something going, it drifts, drifts off. I think this show will go on forever. I think it's a, a, a production that is timeless. There's nothing in it you can date. No. It's just... No. OK, the, the, the television techniques, the sound techniques and everything, things have moved on. Technology has moved on now. But it's not... I mean, the, uh, apart from that, the, the storyline, the, the whole production is timeless. You can probably still sit children youngsters in front of this series in 20, t- 20 years' time, 30 years' time, and they'll still go, it's fantasy land. It's fantasy land. My daughter used to watch it. Um, didn't you? Yeah, there you go. Um, you can just put it on. And I think the, the fans at that time, are fr- I, they're, they're our friends now. I call them our fans, but they've been loyal to us all this time. And now they let their children watch it. And their children... Uh, uh, enamoured yeah, yeah. by it. I think it's it's a timeless a timeless piece, and I think the music, the 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 storylines, yes, it's very simple, um, but it's timeless, and that's I, the magic of it. I think since the Bugaloos were made and released, there's been three generations, and that will not cease. God, are we that old? Well, you, there was an adult audience and their <laughs> children and their children's yes. children. So that's three generations yes. in the thirty it, it, years it's been up and running. Mm. And it will just go on and on. There's nothing in there you can actually date. It's just it's just good, clean, honest fun. And it's children enjoying themselves or kids mm. enjoying themselves. And it, there's all the puppetry, the magic of the puppetry. I mean, it was second to none, yes. wasn't it? It was so professional. I have to say, it was everything was done so professional. It was, it was, and I think Tony Sharney did a really good job in direction. You could see that he had the expertise in that. But mm. it will go on and on. And it will. I, I sincerely think that the Bugaloos will still be going another 30 years' time. I think it was probably one of the best times in my life. And it's something oh, yes. I'll always remember. Yes. And I think it'll always be a place in my heart for Christ. the Bugaloos. Mm. And, of course, the Bugaloos fans. Yeah. No, very, very special. Magic. A magic moment in our lives. And, and that moment, I think, will, will go on for a long time yet.